Test, test, test. Here's your sync point. Hello, all of your little demons. Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you. Yes, you, the person who thinks that smoking makes them look cool, except every single time you take a drag, you're like... <coughs> Obi-Wan was right, these are death sticks. Yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. And today we have ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba, Seth McNeil for their suggestion of eight video game deaths that you just couldn't give a toss about. And you know what? Death as a storytelling concept or a trope is a very, very common one. It's a very relied upon mechanic in order to get across exposition or put motivation into a hero's quest. So in many ways, death is actually the start of many heroes' adventures, but it can be done wrong. And video games definitely have done a lot of them pretty, pretty poorly. So what we're gonna do today is take a look and all of those times that we buried these characters six feet deep only for their little middle fingers to rise up out of the grave and say, <laughs> this was a stinker. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are eight video game deaths that just didn't work. And you know the drill by now. Chuck your suggestions for next week's episode down in the comment section below. Completely had a brain fart just there. And let's get on with this list, shall we? <laughs> what am I doing? Number eight. Trish, Devil May Cry. Now with all of the demon ass kicking that goes on in the Devil May Cry franchise, it's actually easy to forget that there's another narrative going on of sibling rivalry and um, quite a lot of daddy issues. Along the way, helping you fell your fearsome father is Trish, who is an absolute badass. She cracks wise and uses dem thighs to kick the ever-loving piss out of demons throughout your adventure. And it seems that even cool poser boy Dante might have actually found someone as nearly 2000s extreme as him. That's Trish. The growing tension between the two is actually used as a motivator for the final fight with Dante's deadbeat dad Mundus, as it's revealed that Trish has been working with this claymation-looking big bad, yet chooses to jump in the way of one of his attacks to protect this white-haired, silver-tongued devil. This shocking death allows Dante to unleash the beast and send his father out for cigarettes for good. And you know what? If it had just been left here, this is a bittersweet ending. It's an emotional cap to this adventure. Adventure. The problem is, is that he returns to Trish's body and reveals this horrible line. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! Ooh, that definitely does kill the heat somewhat, doesn't it? I mean, if Drew Coombs' voice hadn't done the little voice break there, it probably would have been a bit better, but it's not saying much. It's an awful line that definitely detracts from the emotion you're meant to be feeling. And instead of you going, Trish, no, you're going, <coughs> Dante, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, it didn't really work. Number seven, Adam Phoenix, Gears of War 3. Gears of War 3 definitely had a lot on its plate and a ton of loose ends to wrap up with its narrative. It was basically like the equivalent of having a full English breakfast and then adding, I don't know, like mash on top of it. Bit of Dom's dead wife, yeah, why not chuck that on as well? Marcus Phoenix looking for his dad, yeah, there's a bit of space over here next to the beans. The Locust Queen, is she trying to pull strings behind the scenes? Ooh, I struck it in my mouth, mate, struck it in my mouth. And then there's just like, oh, the Lambent version, they're evolving, bit of gravy in the ear. It's too much. It is a lot to take in, is basically what I'm trying to say, and yet it was up to Gears of War 3 to try and close things out the best it could. And you know what? When it came to Dom's death, they absolutely nailed it. This was a moment that felt earned. That was a truly emotional sacrifice for his friends. Marcus's dad's death, on the other hand? Ah, I forgot it happened. <laughs> Playing second fiddle to Dom's death, Adam Phoenix's demise felt little more than plot necessity rather than emotional payoff, and the character was resurrected and then killed off again in a matter of hours, leaving players almost confused as to what the bloody point of it was. Number 6. Caden, Mass Effect 1 so here's the thing, I love video games that offer me choices, and if I'm left sweating bullets hovering over the reset button in case I make the wrong one, then all the better. Inversely, the thing I hate the most is when video games give us the either the illusion of choice, or basically the choices are so stupid that you would never pick one of the options, or there's just no reason to have a choice at all. Hello, the choice between Ashley and Caden in Mass Effect 1. 
That's all I'm saying. Yeah, Caden is easily the worst party member that joins Shepard on their quest to save the known universe. I mean, he's so generic, annoying, clingy, and judgmental that I would take the soulless husks that comprise Mass Effect Andromeda's party members over him in an instant. Thus, when it came to the supposedly emotional final climax where you have to decide which of the two party members you're going to leave behind in a heroic final stand, I was hammering the kill Caden button so hard it went through the bloody controller. It absolutely sucks that so many of us were ready to jettison a party member so bloody quickly, but when your character development boils down to, oh, I, I, I wouldn't do that if I were you, then absolutely get in the bin and get out of my game. In fact, you know what? It's going to inspire this week's musical interlude. Osley, my friend, are you ready to party down, pal? Yep, that's me, Mr. Party Boy. James, my friend. Are you ready to shake that body? Yes, and I've brought a trombone. Because it's time for a shepherd dance off. Kill Caden. Kill Caden. Kill Caden. Kill Caden. Kill Caden. Kill Caden. Hello, HR. Yeah, it's Jules again. Number five, Maya and Lilith, Borderlands 3. Borderlands 3 was definitely a game of two halves, wasn't it? On the one hand, you had the sublime first-person shooting that felt really rewarding. You had so much looty than you could ever fit in your booty, and you had the colorful, over-the-top, explosive environments. That was the good stuff. On the other side, you had the story which tried and failed to one-up Handsome Jack with two annoying and utterly ineffective villains, a ton of guff designed to pad out the narrative, and of course, some pretty cheap deaths. In Borderlands 2, we actually may have shed a tear over the sudden demise of Roland, but here, with Lilith and Maya, two mainstay fan favourites, well, things ended up just feeling very flat indeed. Maybe it was the lacklustre way in which they were killed, with cutscenes showing a baffling lack of badass from these two sirens, or maybe it was the fact that both were offed only to try and push less likeable characters to the forefront. I know that this series operates on a rotating cast of heroes, but it definitely feels like we were trading down here. It was like trading a Mar bar at school for a kick in the shins and somebody pissing on your history workbook. You wouldn't take that. Number four, any death in Kingdom Hearts. Now, it might seem strange to make such a sweeping statement as no deaths matter in Kingdom Hearts, but seriously, aside from a few villains that do actually disappear for a long old while, when it comes to allies and friends and party members, it's very much, tis but a flesh wound. I mean, look at the opening game in which your pals on generic holiday island are killed off only to be brought back at the end, or where Sora kills himself but gets brought back mere moments later, or the best of the best, when Maleficent gets brought back to life simply because other characters Remember, she exists! <laughs> what is this? In fact, things got so bad that when series creator Tetsuya Nomura was quizzed on who is actually dead amongst the cast, he said that he's not even sure that the concept of death even exists in this franchise. And it's a rather callous approach that has meant that whenever we're met with a farewell or a send off, that we're just like, see you in a bit. Number three, Bill Left for Dead. Now, there are a fair few games that let you play out the events of a story only to be told by the game itself that only certain things happened in terms of the canon. Take, for example, uh, Frank West from Dead Rising. He doesn't actually die until Dead Rising 4, and then he comes back. God, I've just remembered that game, and I hate it. Why did I even use this as an example? Come on, think of a better one. Think of a better one. Or Resident Evil, where you, in the first game, could either try and save Jill or Chris and fail at saving either one of them, but obviously in canon, they both go on to live happy. Well, as happy as you can be with tons of uh, bio-terrorist <laughs> organization breakouts. But they're still alive. That's what I'm trying to say. Certain events are canon. Such as Bill's death in Left 4 Dead and... Um, it didn't really work, if you ask me. Now, the franchise isn't exactly known for huge character development, but that didn't stop us from falling in love with both of the cast of the original and the sequel. In the passing DLC, we're told that Bill sacrificed himself to save the group, and at that point in time, it really did feel like a bit of a gut punch. Bill was grizzled, quick-witted, and an even quicker shot, so it was a genuine shame to lose him. However, when the Sacrifice DLC came out and let us play through this event, we found out that Bill didn't actually need to die at all as any player could stay behind and embrace their heroic fate. 
What this meant was is that players were expecting to see some sort of scripted event that would see him go and we'd actually have this emotional send-off only for it to be completely undone by just whoever was either the fastest or the most unlucky to be left behind in actuality. So it worked on paper up until the point that we got to play through it and then it was just a case of, oh, that's not how I thought it was going to go. Number two, Mikey, Ride to Hell Retribution. So my friends, let me tell you a story. A man returns home from the Vietnam War. He returns home to a land that he no longer knows. Things have changed in his absence, some for the better, some for the worst. He returns to find his brother, now despondent and distant, unable to connect with him. They eventually start building a relationship anew with their shared love of bands, music, and motorcycles. Things seem to be getting better for them as they start to repair the fractured family that once was, until his younger brother falls foul of another rival motorcycle gang. His throat is slit. The young man sees his brother die in front of him and vows revenge. Now on paper, that actually sounds like a pretty good, if a little generic story, right? But either way, it's going to be a fun tale of revenge. Now take that story, slather it with enough cheese for it to resemble a fromagerie, get the worst voice actors in the world to have a crack at it over a lunch break in which they're recording into a tin can on string. He's just a kid. And then make sure that you get the animators to rig it up, looking like it was being dragged from the ocean depths itself. And you have... Ride to Hell Retribution. This game is uglier than an exploded kitten in a microwave, and I do not give a single shit that your brother Mikey dies, because you know what? This game is like licking Bielsa Blob's armpits. He doesn't have them, and I don't want to lick him anyway. Praise slime Jesus. Save me from this game. This is an absolute sin, isn't it? And number one, Slippy Toad. Star Fox for the SNES. So fans of the Star Fox franchise, you might not already know this, if you fail to save your team members, they actually die. In the later games, they just go limping back to their Star Fox HQ in the spacey skies of space, and they just repair themselves, get their robotic legs fixed up again. But in the first game, once they're dead, they're dead. Slippy Toad is also in this game. Can you see where I'm going with this? While trying to save the rest of your teammate for some pretty tense moments, Slippy Toad's death, not so much. Now, in all fairness, in this original form, Slippy isn't that annoying. In fact, he's downright reserved compared to his frustrating future self, but playing this game with the foresight of where he will end up makes it so incredibly hard to commit to pulling the trigger and saving him time and time again. Now, I won't lie to you, watching his ship go down in flames, well, that... <laughs> That just brought a big old smile to my face. Get down, come on. A man's died. Come on, Jules. I'm so sad he's dead. <laughs> I'm so sad that Slippy Toad died. <laughs> yeah, I didn't give a single sh Oh, and there we go, my friends. That was eight video game deaths yet did not give a single toss about. I hope that you enjoyed that. And let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below, as well as any other suggestions for next week's episode, because I would love to see them. I love reading all of them. I love all the little community meshes that we get out. And it's just, it's beautiful seeing the community grow. So thank you so much for joining me here today and for helping support this lovely format. It is literally the highlight of my week. Thank you. If you want to follow me further, you can do so over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let Dice do a little bit of the robot for you to really engage you. It's my personal gaming channel. Do a lot of streaming Wednesdays and Sundays. Wednesdays at the moment, I'm doing a Fallout New Vegas run with community challenges, so you guys get to decide how I play. For example, last week uh, I did a Master Chef one where I could only use flame weapons and only heal by eating what I cooked. That didn't go well, but still, yeah, if you like that, then come check it out. And on Sundays, we stream D&D, &D, which will be really fun if you like that sort of thing as well. So I hope to see you over there, my friends. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. We detail today a lot about video game deaths. And in the real world, it is an unfortunate inevitability that is going to happen to us and to the people around us. We live, we love, we die. But as I've said several times over, don't let somebody's death impact your life so much so that you fail to live it. Take what they've taught you, take the love, take the lessons that they've given you and use that to move forward. Don't exist in their shadow because you won't end up living your full life. It is a painful, horrible, 
really unfair thing to go through. But trust me, things will get better if you remember them for the good things that they offered you and don't live in the shadow of what they cast. Okay? Now go out there and absolutely smash it. Live your life to the goddamn full because you are a big ledge. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never, ever forget that. I'll speak to you soon, all right? Peace.